Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Zara and today I am going to be doing a review of Out by Natsuo Kirino. This is a book that I've had on my radar for a very long time. It's a book that I've been wanting to read for a few years and the reason why is because that when I was reading reviews and doing a bunch of research around it, it is very divisive and the reason why it's very divisive is because it is extremely dark and it really peers into the darker aspects of Japanese society and culture and it doesn't hold back it really really does not hold back so I was very curious a lot of you who've been watching my channel for a while will know that I like darker thematic work in my books I love dark fantasy I also love classics and contemporary fiction that tend to have darker themes so when I came across this book and given my interest in Japanese culture and society it kind of married up a bunch of my different interests and the types of stuff that I like reading in my books. Before I jump into my non-spoiler review, I do just want to give a trigger warning for this book. This book is grotesque, it's violent, and there are trigger warnings for everything. It doesn't shy away from vividly describing every disgusting act that happens. Do not read it if you are averse to physical and or emotional violence in any capacity. It made my stomach turn even a few times and that's saying something because it takes a lot to make my stomach turn to be completely honest. I do not say any of this lightly so if this is something that remotely puts you off I would suggest staying away from this book because you also don't know when it comes it just happens it slaps you in the face and you know I think a lot of people are not gonna like that that's why I've really put emphasis on, on the fact that this book is very very violent in every way so with that in mind I'm gonna jump into a very very brief synopsis we are essentially following four women characters they are all working a late night shift in a food packaging company and they are all dissatisfied with their lives in one way or another we do also follow to other male characters as well they're more like secondary characters and these two people know our four female characters in one way or another and we see their role in society and how their position in society also contrasts with our four main POVs. Naturally even with a multi POV story we do have one central character that, that kind of connects all of these other characters together and I will come on to that more later on when I talk about characters but this is a story that is very slow it, there isn't tons of action I mean there is a lot of violence but it's done in a way that's quite quiet and meditative in a way I really can't think of a better way to describe it than that and I think with that in mind let's jump into my review and let's talk about what I liked about it so the first thing that really strikes you about this book from the first page is the tone and the setting of this book we really get a sense that there is not a lot of hope in this story and that there's not going to be a lot of hope in the story. It feels very grim and we are, st we are struck with the stark reality of what it's like being a woman in Japanese society who isn't working like a high flying job. Our four main female characters, they are all living lives that they are not excited about. They are all living lives where they're worrying about money and they have pressure on them from other people and society as a whole. And so we really get this sense of just complete apathy towards life, which I think when I was reading this book, I was in the right mood for it. But I can imagine that if I wasn't in the right mood for this book, I probably wouldn't have enjoyed it as much as I did. The tone really sets the book up and it really gets you into the mood of what is to come. That brings me on to the next thing that I really loved, and that is the tension. Now, Natsuo Kirono, from what I understand, is uh, she's she writes a lot of kind of crime fiction, and I think Japan and Japanese authors are recognised as being some of the best in the world at writing crime and writing like psychological thrillers. And without a doubt, just after reading this book, I can see why. And that is because there is this kind of incredible technique that this author uses to create this sense that something is bubbling under the surface both on a very intimate level with all of our characters but also at a macro level with the broader world it feels like something is about to pop it feels like something is about to blow up we don't know what we don't know who we don't know when but it really does feel like it from right at the beginning of the book so by the point that we hit the crescendos we are ready for it and we're almost thankful for the release 
which in some way reflects how the characters feel after those events as well. It's really fascinating to read. I've not seen an author do it that well. And Kirino, without a doubt, is one of the best at doing this. The tension that we feel both on behalf of the characters, but also as a reader is really, really well done. And it just adds an extra layer of something to the overall tone of the book. Now I'm gonna talk about the next thing, and that is the setting. This is a crime noir set in and around Tokyo. We are based in a bunch of different areas. So we, one kind of main setting is the factory where the women package the kind of lunch boxes. That is uh, kind of described as being desolate and being a very lonely place. And I think that's also a very interesting reflection on how our characters are feeling as well. We also get some insight into Kabukicho. So Kabukicho, for those who don't know, is Japan's largest red light district. I also believe it's one of the largest red light districts in the entire world. It's known for being quite grimy. There's, you know, it's also known for being a Yakuza hotbed. It's known for being a place where, you know, you only really go there for one reason. And, you know, why would you go to a red light district? You only really go there for one reason, right? The product that is being sold there is an experience that, that is grimy and dirty. And that's exactly what we feel when we're in these parts of the book. The character that we also follow in these parts of the book is one of the main male characters that we have, Satake. And he, again, I'll come to characters a little bit more later, but again, his personality is really reflected in Kabukicho. And I think this is one thing amongst many other things that Natsu Akirono does really well is, is that where our characters are, both in the beginning and the middle of the book, is really representative of their state of mind, where they are in life. And that was only something that I really kind of realised after I, I finished the book and I was thinking about what I was going to say in my review. The subtlety and the nuance is chef's kiss. It is done to perfection and I think this is one of those books that has a lot of layers and I'm probably missing quite a lot of those layers but this is one of those books that definitely deserves a reread at some point in the future. So now let's move on to the characters. So as I said we are following kind of four main female characters and then we have like two maybe even three actually main male characters but I would say they're not really main characters they're more like secondary characters so we have Masako as I mentioned earlier we have like one main character who kind of connects everybody and that is Masako. Masako is she's one of those people she's clearly very smart before she worked in the factory she was like an accountant, if I remember correctly. She had a pretty well-paying job and she was very well respected in society's eyes. But she had a lot of issues in that job and that's all I'm gonna say. And that ultimately led her to getting fired from the job, which we learned very early on. And that's where, that's how she's ended up working in that factory. She's kind of done with life. She doesn't really have any meaningful relationships with anybody. She's married, she has a child, but all of those relationships are broken. And we really get a sense that she is wanting more, but even she doesn't know what that is. Then we get introduced to three other female characters. I'm not going to jump into them individually just for the sake of time, but we have Kuniko, Yoshi and Yayoi. Now these three characters, they're all very different, but they're all missing one thing and that is money. And Masako is the same. They're all pay very badly they're not able to live like a normal life and so they're all kind of connected by this desire to make something of themselves but also by the desire to have some form of connection even if it's not necessarily the best form of connection if that makes sense they are all in a way almost dependent on each other for survival but in a lot of ways they're also enabling each other which leads to some potentially very disturbing decisions that are made later on their relationships are very complicated in many ways they like each other they respect each other but in other ways they don't and i think it's a very accurate reflection of how what can happen when you have surface level relationships with people who are in similar situations to you, you can always in a way end up resenting them. And I thought that was really beautifully represented in their quartet and how they interact with each other, especially when you compare it from the start of the book all the way up to the end of the book. Then we have our male characters. I mentioned Satake. So Satake is a Yakuza member and he's basically a, a thug and he owns a bunch of businesses in Kabukicho. He is presented to us as being one of the villains of the story, but what you realise by the end of this book is that there are no villains in this book. They are all villains. They've all done things that are very morally 
questionable, some things that are straight up just wrong and illegal. And it's just really, really fascinating to read how his role by the end of it, we actually feel empathy to some very small extent towards him. And in a way that empathy gets moved from the female characters over to him, which I thought was really interesting and quite a, quite a weird experience to change perspective on all of these characters and their standings in this book. But that's not to say that the four women are, you know, are good or bad. They're also very morally grey. And that's, I've said this many times before, and I know for a fact I'll say it many times again, I love morally grey characters because that's ultimately what it means to be human. I, I don't believe that there is just people who are 100% good and 100% bad. I think everybody is a shade of grey. Some tend to be more on the good side. Some tend to be more on the not so good side. But we are all shades of grey. And I think they are all very much on the scale of being on that side, the not good side. But their position on that scale changes throughout the book. And that's really, really fascinating to read. We do have a, a few other male characters, but I think, again, just for the sake of time, I'm just going to focus on Satake for now. But there is a really great cast of characters that feels very fleshed out. We know why these characters are doing what they're doing. We know why they're in their respective situations. We know what motivates them. And that's all I want from an author is to have fleshed out characters, even if they're not in the book that much, give us enough of a layer to be able to really grapple with these people and why they are doing what they're doing and I can get behind them even if I disagree with them. That's not to say that I endorse what they're doing, it just means I can get behind why they're doing what they're doing, even if I fundamentally disagree with it on a moral and kind of ethical level. And now let's move on to the pacing. I think a lot of people are going to find this book quite slow. Uh, it's actually a criticism that I saw quite a lot when I was reading reviews about it after I finished the book. I personally don't think it is. Like, I think it has a lot of build up. And I think in order to hit those crescendos that I mentioned earlier, I think it has to have a slow build up. I think we really need to get a lay of the land of like, we really get like the setting of like what is happening in the broader world, but also what is happening with each of our individual characters. And that is naturally going to take some time to build up. And I really like that the author spent the time to do that. That's something for you to bear in mind though. If you don't like very slow burns, you're probably not going to enjoy aspects of this book just because it's not all guns blazing all the time. I would say that's maybe 20%, 30% of the time. The other 70% is people sitting around talking, reflecting, and thinking about the consequences of their actions. And that's stuff that I love, but I'm very aware that a lot of people might not like that. So that's just something to be aware of. Now let's move on to the thematic work. There is so much thematic work packed in this book. It's incredible. Now, I think one of the things, whenever you know, you're know you reading uh, any piece of fiction is to take what is being written in that book with a pinch of salt. And by that, I mean that, you know, one of the most common pieces of criticism that I saw about this book is that it's not a good reflection of Japanese society. Now, I don't know how much those people know of Japanese society. A lot of those people were Western people when I was, you could just tell from the names. So I don't know how this was received in Japan. I do think it's like a bestseller in Japan though. So I think that in itself is quite indicative, but uh, that is one common thing that I saw come up. I personally don't think a book needs to represent the entirety of a country in order for it to be a good reflection. I find it quite believable given, you know, that I've been reading a lot about Japanese society and culture over the last, you know, year and a half now. I've, I've been watching a lot of documentaries about Japan, a lot of articles. I've actually made quite a few Japanese friends in the last year as well. So, you know, I speak to them about this stuff because I, I genuinely find it very interesting and I want to learn about different cultures. I think this book represents probably quite a decent subsection of Japan that where the underlying themes probably do apply and represent. I do find that some of the characters and the struggles that they go through and then also the broader issues that are brought up about like the Japanese economic system and the kind of culture around work and how work is kind of seen as um, a very respectable thing to have. I mean, that's the same to some extent in Western societies as well, but I think in Japan, it's heavily internalized that 
if you are like a productive member of society, you are instantly seen as better than people who aren't. I found a lot of things like that rang true based on all the reading that I've done and watching and talking to people over the last year and a bit. So I don't find I don't find that it needs to reflect every single person in Japan. I just think it needs to reflect enough of a subsection of Japan that it feels relatable. I mean, Natsuo Kirino is also Japanese. Again, that's not to say that she's necessarily going to represent every aspect of Japan because I don't know much about her background but she could just be in a microcosm just like there are many people who are microcosms in the west but that's again you know but my point of raising that is is that just because it doesn't apply to every single person in Japan doesn't necessarily mean that the thematic work is not good so anyway and now I'm now going to move on to the thematic work and this is the, the kind of last bit that I'll talk about I think the really interesting thing about this book is is that we get a lot of exploration around the cost of unintended actions and their consequences, not just on the individual who commits that action, but on the people around them as well, whether it's their friends, their colleagues, their family, their neighbours, whatever it may be. It's just about how it can have secondary tertiary impacts and consequences on individuals and I just, I just think that's something that's really interesting and something that I think about quite a lot. There's also a very interesting piece around the role of women in society. Naturally, we are for, we are following four female characters and the contrast of that uh, against the men. Generally, a lot of exploration around family dynamics about the woman having to work, but then also essentially having to work when she's at home as well, pro providing for the family in the sense that she's cooking dinner, she's putting the child to sleep, she's looking after the mother-in-law all of those things she doesn't really have a reprieve but then the male figure can go out and do whatever he wants and go to clubs and gamble away their money but it's not really seen as a negative it's it's kind of accepted in a way and I thought that was quite interesting and seems to be quite a, a common theme of that I've seen in Japanese books that I've read before and articles that I've read uh, in recent years so I, I really like that and I, I you know I think it doesn't hold back and I think it shows how the banality of life can seep into every day and we don't even realise it and I think more interestingly how that then impacts our relationship with the world and with people around us. I just really like that as a theme and it's again something that I think about quite a lot. Uh, there's also themes around revenge, redemption, finding those who also truly understand us. There's one thread in this book that I won't go into too much detail because it is a very big spoiler. But one of our characters, she actually has a very interesting connection to one of our other characters. And it's the weirdest but also most compelling, or one of the most compelling things about this book, about how these two characters are so different in so many ways one is a man and one is a woman, but then how they're actually very similar at the root, but they manifest it in different ways. And it was just so well done. It was very uncomfortable to read at points, but it was executed to perfection. There's also a, a really interesting theme around how everybody has the capacity to inflict pain, commit violence and commit truly evil acts. Nobody is kind of protected from that everybody has that capacity it's just a matter of how you deal with it and how you internalize it I guess and I just I thought that was really really interesting there is one last thing that I will mention and that is that there is a dark macabre humor that seems to be very common in Japanese writing and I really like it like I really really do like it I've said this before I've, I've, got, I've got quite a, a, a kind of dark humor myself it's quite common in England, I think. We just seem to, to, to have that type of humour. It's quite sarcastic, it's very dark. Uh, not everybody quite gets it, but I think that seems to be quite representative in a lot of Japanese crime thriller books, and I love it. I absolutely love it. I think maybe it's because we're both island people, so we end up having the same humour, but it's really, really good, and it contrasts with the heavier moments in the book and it's it's just it's just perfect it really provides a tiny bit of light relief but not in a way that is going to detract from the story it really adds to the overall atmosphere and tone of the book so i'm going to end there 
I absolutely love this book. I gave it a 4.5 stars and the only reason why I didn't give it a full 5 stars is that I do think the grotesqueness was sometimes taken a little bit too far. But honestly, as I've been thinking about this book upon reflection, I do think it deserves the 5 stars just because I don't think it's done in a way that is for shock value. Though I do think that is quite a common critique. I think a lot of people think it's done just for shock value, but I actually don't think it is. I, I think it's done to show that every human has the ability to do absolutely horrific things. And I think Kirino gets that message across very well. So I definitely recommend this book, but like I said, I don't I, I wouldn't recommend it to most people. I think if you're somebody who likes darker fantasy, I think a lot of you who watch my channel you know, initially watched me for my fantasy and, and grim dark recommendations. If you like grim dark, if you like dark fantasy, if you're if you like manga, like I think this is it kind of bridges a bunch of my different interests, and I think it's just an excellently written book that I think more people in the West should read. Not only because I think it just provides a different lens through which to view Japanese society, which I think is important, but I think it's also just extraordinarily well written. And there's a lot of techniques and mechanisms that Kirano uses very, very well to achieve what she wants to achieve in this book. So there we have it. Definitely go read it. If you have any questions about it, if you have any concerns about potentially reading it, don't hesitate to ping me or email me or message me on any one of my social media. I will, I will help in any way that I can. But I hope you liked my review. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up and I will see you in my next video. Thanks for watching, folks. Stay safe as always. Take care and I will see you soon. Bye.